do you think there are certain families running the world and, and, and have done for generations? Well, I think that if we looked like in the south of in the south of Ireland, where we only learned recently that there was a go golden circle operating within Anglo Irish Bank, and uh, I don't think it's that difficult for people to to at least look at the possibility that there is a shadow government operating behind the scenes that is permanent, uh, that doesn't change, whereas the puppets come and go like the presidents. Right. Now, I mean, we'd explain the golden circle easily by saying it's not hard to understand how a number of people within an institution or within a number of institutions could get together and look after themselves or do things that benefit each other. It's not hard to see how that happens, but that's a world removed from families who generation after generation through that family line continue with this particular way of living where they're controlling the world or something. I mean, that, that's different, isn't it? Well, maybe, but uh, I, I mean, the, the what is speculated basically is that the, that is that the the crown, the Queen of England, mm -hmm. that they switched from from overt rule to covert rule, and it's basically done because of the peasantry uprisings that were occurring, and they inv they invented this this system, this system of democracy, where they installed their political proxies, but they were still in control from behind the right, scenes. Right. So they made them think that they had democracy. Yeah. But yeah. Like people say we think we have it, we don't in Ireland. Yeah. You say that today. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry for for keeping you there, Ian, but we, we want to hear obviously the, the, the context to it from, from Jim and Ian you uh, might not be that well known in, in Ireland but you're certainly known uh, in the oil industry or you were and probably are even better known now because you worked in the oil industry for a company that we wouldn't particularly know but people in the oil business would know and you were in Kuwait after the war what what took you there was it to do with the oil fields yeah it was indeed fire, no, yeah. I was one of the first civilians to go into uh, Kuwait at the end of hostilities so that was late March of 1991 almost almost exactly 20 years ago and I went in there with um, uh, three other colleagues from the oil industry and our, our job at that time was to actually take a look at the situation in Kuwait and look at the logistics both equipment and people that uh, we thought we were going to need to um, address the the well fires that were burning there mm. and you say that the Americans did it well um, let me put it this way you know as we were driving around um, as we were driving around southern Kuwait um, with our military escort, the physical evidence that I, you know, witnessed firsthand made me call into question the official version of events. Yeah, that's because you saw Iraqi bodies lying around the oil wells and you thought, why would there be Iraqi soldiers lying dead here? It looked to me like they were protecting the oil wells. Isn't that right? That's exactly, that's exactly but, right. But is it not equally plausible to think that they were shot whilst the Americans were trying to get in there and uh, or the Brits to try and get the the oil wells back again no well I mean there's a possibility but um, you is know, that not equally as plausible it's plausible but what accelerated my concern was an a sin incident just a couple of days later when I was sitting in the um, in the mess at, in Akmadi which is the headquarters of the QAD oil company and and obviously the comments and observations that I'd been making as we were driving around had been passed on to um, you know his superior by the, uh, the the driver, the military driver that we had. And this guy made a beeline for me while I was sitting at dinner. He knew exactly who I was. He walked straight over to me and he said, Yuri and Crane? And I, I just didn't answer. And he mm. said, uh, you know, I've been hearing you've been cast in some aspersion about who set them wells alight. Mm. And again, I didn't say anything. He said, you know, boy, he said, that's the kind of thinking that can get you into a whole lot of trouble. You best be keeping your mouth shut. And then he went to walk away and he looked over his shoulder and he said, uh, what the, is the matter, Ian? Mm. Aren't we paying you enough? Mm. And and although I'm telling the story fairly glibly now, after you were so years, worried, you thought you might die on the way to. Well, I thought you know if they're prepared to manipulate an event but, of but, this but, in but, order. But to you see what I what I thought. I listened to this. Uh, I listened to this story that you're telling now last night on the internet and what struck me was that you believed straight away that this guy who approached you was uh, threatening you in some way in a very sort of well not not even that secretly he was saying to you look that can get you into trouble. But it may not have meant that at all, because you never got to challenge him after. You just took that. I mean, he said to you, they could get you into a lot of trouble talking like that. I mean, he, he may have meant, you know, how dare you suggest that we would do this to our own oil fields. That's a terrible and a dangerous thing to be saying. He may have meant that. But you went away from there, thinking this guy was on your case, and got paranoid about it. That's what occurred to me. Were you not just paranoid? Thought, oh, my God. And you'd, you'd created this in your mind that this guy was after you now, and, and possibly you were going to be killed. And as a result of that, it's fed into this paranoia you've got now about what's going on, and that there's other people controlling. Well, I, mean, I probably would never even have mentioned this story mm. were it not for the fact that in 2003 I actually received um, a letter which was forwarded to me by the US Veterans Association yeah. um, and it was a letter from a corroborated uh, member of the US Special Forces who had admitted 
to the US Veterans Association that he was a member of the Special Forces team that set the wells alight in Kuwait. All right. Now, l last night, when I was um, reading up about you, because uh, I, I knew about Jim, obviously, but I didn't know much about you, and, and I saw you being interviewed, and that's why I, I found out a little bit about the, the, the oil work you've done. And, you know, th 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 this, I would suggest, maybe is, is the kind of thing that puts you up for ridicule. It was a guy in a starship or spaceship who was interviewing you, a pretend one, and he beamed you into it, and you were beamed up into this spaceship, and then he interviewed you in, in the spaceship. And I thought, um, at first I didn't understand what was going on, and doesn't, doesn't that kind of thing that you obviously went along with put you up for ridicule? Oh, no, I don't think so. Richard D. Hall is the guy, and yeah. I mean, he's a credible interviewer. He's a bit of a showman, and he's created a show uh, that's simply, you know, set on board a starship. I mean, Why? That's just his his theme. It's what he's created. Right. But you know, let me let me just make the point here, Sean. That I think. But you that understand that. I don't understand you? that. But let me make the point that you know we don't expect anybody to take what we say at face yeah. value. I mean, this is this is I think the fundamental issue for, that Jim and I try and get across. What we're doing in our presentations is we present the facts as we believe them, and then what we ask people to do is is listen to what we have to say review what yeah. we have to say and then take away that information and review it for themselves i could i could talk to you for an hour and there's that you, there's there's so much more that that you want to say and 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 you would say needs to be said but time's not permitting us um you, you're going to be speaking tonight people have a chance to come along tonight in donegal tomorrow in Derry. you're doing a kind of a nationwide tour at the moment you're charging for it as well so people might put to, to you the accusation that this is a money racket for you not in the <laughs> music oh, no but they I mean, might 12 euros a person well 12 euros you know it hardly covers the the price of the venue and uh, the accommodation the travel the advertising in the media the advertising do you know what i mean well i don't know because i don't know how many people come to it but i mean you charge so w would yeah. you say you're not in well, it for the well, money if you go onto my website jimcore.com you will not find one advertisement mm. so you're not in it for the money of course not. No. But, I mean, you, that's a legitimate question. If you charge for something, I mean, you know... Twelve you, euros. You could... Yeah, twelve euro. I mean, if 500 people turned up, there'd be five, thousand, six thousand. Sean, do you get paid yeah. for what you do? do you? Of course I do. Well, that, that, so that's how you live? Yeah. Yeah, well, I yeah, have but to, I, I, have I, to I don't too. hide that. Of course I get paid for yeah, well, it. So but but I, you're saying you're not doing it for a levy. You're not doing it for, for your job, like. So it's a legitimate no, question. No, but I still have to live. I know, but it's a legitimate question. So people... Do you think this is a career move for me? <laughs> I, I, I'm not... I'm not here to judge. I'm, I'm here to ask questions okay, of you. Well, you don't on. like I that. Probably, you probably, don't like that question, but I've asked it. Hang on a yeah. sec. I've probably compromised my musical career by doing this, right. by bringing the truth to the people as I see it, because I care about humanity. Yeah. I'm not in this. I know, but Jim, you can't expect to, you know, be on a program like this, uh, telling people things like you're telling them now. I mean, a lot of people died on 9-11. It's a very serious matter. We've got a comment here saying you shouldn't even be on the radio say that. How dare you let people on the radio make it a mockery out of it? And then uh, expect not to read be challenged. And comments. people are entitled. I've read them. Any I have, I'll show them to you. If, you, if, you, can, if you can find them, there they are. There they are. There's the text. Uh, read Look at them. Positive comments. Look, read I'm them, sure Jim. Read them, Jim. There they are. There's the text. There's the screen. Read them. Well, well, hang on a sec. If, if you, in, in relation to 9-11, mm. just think about this for a second. 60% of the 9-11 Commission members who are tasked with the investigation have recently publicly stated that the investigation was a fraud, mm. that there needs to be a new investigation and that they were hindered by the White House. What do you think? Yeah, of that? but you know what I think, Jim? I think that people should go along tonight if they're interested and listen to what you have no, to say. No, but what do you think but, but, of that? 60% you know of the 9-11 Commission yeah. members said the investigation was a fraud. Do you know what I think? I think it just proves, though, you've proven the point that you don't trust even me asking you the questions because you just said to me, show them the positive comments, which suggests that you think that we've just dictated now the no, I just want to know your opinion. No, you didn't. No, wait a minute, Jim. You said show us the positive comments. I've just offered to show you the screen, which you didn't even look at, and they I are the text be. coming in. Yeah. They're the text. There they are. But right. Sean, Sean, the real, the not, real hang, issue. Hang on a second. And they're not positive, so I can't make them up. Yeah, but the real issue but you is, must the, think is I am the making them. Ireland is on the Ireland is on the brink of disappearing. Ireland is absolutely on the brink of disappearing. You know, it's a it's a nation that's had its own sovereignty mm -hmm. since 1922. You know, and here we are, less than a hundred years later, and forces are being brought to bear, and right. the Irish people are about to right. be totally subjugated. All right, into and, an and, and you've mentioned your website, and they can go there, and they can read more. They can go tonight. I've mentioned it three times now. Inishering Gateway Hotel tonight, and we've got to leave it there because the news is coming up. But Jim, I appreciate you coming in. Thank you very much, and Ian R. Crane, thank you too. Thank you, sure. Okay, stand by for the news.